reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and to recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As always, a, a deep thanks for the choir for your beautiful music before I stand up here to give a message. Thanks to all the people who make that possible for the congregation gathered here today and those out there online that may be watching. It's been a few weeks since we've not been able to show our services online with some technical difficulties. Hopefully now it is all working, people working hard in the background to make sure it happens. And so I look forward to hearing that it worked today. So here we are once again. We are now in the lectionary reading from the Gospel of Luke. This Sunday and next Sunday, we'll be looking at the stories as it comes to us from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4, today 14 through 21, next week 21 through 30. It's a whole story we can't separate uh, for very long. It's a great story. It's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In fact, he's telling us what he's going to be about. In the first few chapters of Luke, we have, of course, the preparation for his birth. We have the birth story in Chapter 2 and chapter 3, he goes and gets lost in, well, his parents thought he was lost in Jerusalem. He was with the scribes. He gets baptized. He goes to the wilderness. And then it begins in chapter 4. He's going across all of Galilee. He returns there. And people are taking notice of who he is and what he's talking about. So we come to a time in the synagogue when he stands up before the people and reminding all of you that he's from Nazareth, he's the hometown boy, he's coming back home, and they're all excited about seeing him. They all probably remember him when he was this high, and now he's reading scripture. And as it says in our story, you can certainly read along in the story in the Pew Bibles, it says he stands up, the attendant gives him the scroll. There are many scrolls around in the synagogue and this attendant picks Isaiah and you can just imagine Jesus scrolling through all those chapters of Isaiah. All of them passing by all these wonderful prophecies. Going through the suffering servant idea until he finally reaches chapter 61 verses 1 and 2. So, we begin. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy God, be with us now in our eyes and our seeing, our ears and our hearing, our lives and our living this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in the fall of 1981, I was a seminarian at Yale Divinity School. And I was a seminarian also at the Brantford Congregational Church. Brantford was a a little city, a little village, just east of New Haven. And that was my placement for the year. In fact, it was a two-year time. I went back my following year, my second year. And it was the habit and the custom of 
the pastors there, there's a senior pastor, Roger, and associate pastor, Doug, and then myself. We would meet outside the sanctuary door and have a prayer and just gather our thoughts, and then we'd walk in together. Well, in that fall, one of the first weeks I was there, Roger wasn't there. Doug and I were wondering what was going on and a little concerned about what the service would look like. And then finally, we see Roger coming down the hallway holding his eye. And he gets up to us and he says, I can't see out of my eye. Something's wrong. It really hurts. And so I called my doctor and I'm leaving right now. Harry, here's my sermon. <laughs> I thought he should give it to Doug. But he gave it to me for some reason. Now, I've heard him preach a few Sundays, and I didn't always quite get his sermons. I didn't really know what he was going after and so forth. Didn't re really think I would probably say those same words. And here I was, given his manuscript to read it word by word. And so I had a decision to make. I didn't have a chance to really read it through before I gave it. <clears throat> so I quickly scanned each paragraph as I was going. And I said, no, I'm not reading that one, and skip to the next one. And they go a little, no, not, no, I'm not going to, because people may think it's my words and not his. A little worried about that. So I went through my, his sermon that way, and then sat down. Well, in some slight way, there's a connection with what happened that day at the Branford Congregational Church, and the synagogue of Nazareth. Jesus gets the scroll, given the scroll, finds his place, goes up and stands before the people, and he begins reading Isaiah. But if you were to read Isaiah, you can even look it up right now and start to compare, it wasn't the same. There were some things that is in Luke that Jesus read that were not <clears throat> in Isaiah. And there is one phrase that Jesus adds to his reading in front of the friends and family in Nazareth in the synagogue. So what in the world happened there? It's very tempting to get rid of certain things in our life, isn't it? We just say, no, that, we don't need that anymore. And we, I think I've done that a lot during the pandemic, saying, it, it's, yeah, I can skip that part. It's a little more difficult to add something to it. Always adding something to it means you have to think about it. You have to really plan ahead a little bit. You have to imagine and be creative in your thinking. But that's what Jesus did. You know which one it was? Any idea which one he added? If you're at the Bible study Friday, thank you, Alice, for pointing that out to me in the Bible study. Margaret was there. Others were there. Everything was more or less the same until we got to recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus added that to the Scripture. You see, this is the blueprint for his ministry. This is what he is going to do. He said that in the very end. In today, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And this is what Jesus will be doing in the next 18 months or three years, depending on the gospel you read. Those very th same things, sharing the good news. The spirit of God is upon him. Releasing the captives. The year of Jubilee, freeing the oppressed. But he added recovery of sight to the body. Anyone know why he might have added that? If you do, then share in the scholarly discussion through the generations and the centuries. I'm just thinking now to share with all of you why that might have been added by Jesus or by Luke and why that was so important to in the Gospels, we come across so many stories of people who are blind. We don't see that in the Old Testament as much. In the Gospel readings, we do. Blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road, blind since birth or so, and, and uh, he hears Jesus coming along the road and cries out to him. Jesus stops. Later on, he's cured. Other blind people and other stories are mentioned. And we can certainly go with the physical blindness but 
if Jesus was concerned with only the blind, he would probably add the lame as well, or the deaf as well, in this reading of his. It's the blind. What about if the blindness is not physical, but it's spiritual, emotional? It's just a living blindness that we don't see things that we should be seeing. How many things have you not seen and you finally saw it one day and you said, ah, there it is. I don't know why I never noticed it before. Maybe the pandemic helped us understand what we hadn't seen before because we took, in the early days, took a little time off because we couldn't be places we were before. We couldn't see people like we did before. We saw some new things in the world. What have we been blind to? Any ideas? This is okay for you to speak right now. How many of us have been blind to the violence around us in our country? Most of you know that I'm working with New Mexicans to prevent gun violence. And it's not about the getting rid of things. It's about trying to address the situation of violence. And to be honest, I had never really experienced blindness, I'm uh, sorry, violence before until March 8th, 2020. After church, the day Jenny and I were driving to Tucson for our birthdays. The last Sunday before the pandemic, we had to close down. I've told you this story before, but what happened was we were getting off an exit ramp on 25 and heard a big sonic boom, it seemed to us, and it was somebody who shot our car right below the window. If it wasn't for a little strip of metal right below the window, we would have been hurt or killed. Jenny, especially the driver. Until that moment, I never experienced something that we're so close to the violence that so many people understand and experience and are forever changed by. Oh, we're blind to it sometimes, but now we see. How many times does Jesus say that? Or what about climate change? We were probably blind to it until the last couple of years when we were saying, where's the snow? Where's the rain? People, scientists tell us it's because of climate change and what we're doing to the world, perhaps, or in reality. Other issues, we don't see what's going on in the border. We're blind to it. We don't see what's going on in Central America. We don't see what's going on in Afghanistan. We don't see these things. What are we to do to recover our sight to all of these ideas and situations? How important it was for Jesus to put it in there, to say his ministry would be helping the people recover their sight to the world around us. You know, we use John Philip Newell a lot in our services because he's a friend of ours. And he's an amazing teacher about Celtic Christianity. You may still wonder why we have some of those, that liturgy and why I talk about it, why we have the blessing by John Philip New and all of it, because he's helping us to recover our sight to what Christianity was before the empire. Of what original blessing is instead of original sin of the empire of not controlling, but of, of allowing people to be who they are deep in their soul, of worrying about creation, of worrying about all people and knowing that they are sacred. And not only all people, but all animals, all beings, all the earth, the sky is sacred. In the next nine weeks, I'm going to be having a series called Reawakening in Our Souls, using John Philip's books, understanding what it means to look at the world as sacred, and how by doing so, maybe that's one pathway to healing the world. 
So be ready for it. It'll be exciting. But be ready next week as well because the next part of this story is stuff that movies are made out of. I would think that everyone would be feeling, would be feeling so good having heard Jesus and they say, that's my boy. And they would see him sit down and they would do a little clap like this and they would shake hands afterward as we often used to do after services and all would be well and they go home for lunch. But that's not what happens in this story. Look ahead. Get ready for it. Next week we have more to the story and what Jesus left out and then what he tells them. It's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world today. Thanks be to God. Amen.